The number one question on everybody's mind, how low do we go? Stocks suffered another day of losses led by semiconductors, but yields and safe havens came under pressure as a solid sale of 20 year bonds and overboard conditions put a cap on yields and gold. However, the elephant in the room is ASML. ASML lit the dumpster on fire with its earnings disaster that led flows to the downside and it has the market asking the question, is the AI bubble about to burst? Today, we're going to answer that question and talk earnings, liquidity, current state of the economy, and why this chart is absolutely crucial for the next four to six months. We've got a lot to talk about. Let's roll the tape. Welcome everybody to the daily recap show where we talk about stocks and the financial market. My name is Chase. If you like this video, please subscribe. We're trying to hit 10K subscribers in May and hit that notification bell. Let's get into it. Guys, today was just a concerning day of trade, a very, very concerning day of trade. Now, obviously, when you look at this heat map, you see two distinct things, okay? Number one is semiconductors, deep, deep red. Look at this, a AVGO down 3.49%, AMD close to 6%, very concerning in that. You also see the Magnificent 7 down Tesla, Amazon, Meta, Apple, Microsoft, Google doing all right. A lot of the selling today, the broader market was down, was actually contained here in financials. So financials put out a pretty good day. But to me, the most concerning thing I see is right here, staples, okay? Look at this, that's very green. Look at utilities, lit up like a Christmas tree, okay? So where the selling was just a liquidation, as in people just trying to get money out of the market, trying to get cash, people are now actually posturing defensive, which could see signal there still is appetite for risk in the form of equities they're just getting defensive and that is something you don't want to see look at telecom services flat for the day also a defensive sector by the way and then we had stuff like basic materials the inflation hedges look at energy not necessarily green but flat for the day all in all very concerning heat map something you don't want to see and looking at sectors we see some more concerning stuff okay gdx up 1.57 percent xlu up two percent so you know it was a defensive rotation safe haven rotation I guess with gold miners you could say then XLF up 0.25% XLB again the inflation hedges and then after that everything was pretty much down okay let's not look at KRE they're just a complete outlier a dumpster fire and the risk off in KRE is to cover your shorts that is the risk off trade in KRE risk on is actually to short the stock uh, in regional banks then we have XLC okay down 0.09% that is even when Google was up half a percentage point today, right? And then the SPY lost 0.59% with the worst sector being technology, semiconductors, and real estate here continuing to be a complete dumpster fire of a trade down 0.83% when in the last two days it was down anywhere from 2 to 4%. So real, real selling happening in real estate right now. And I wonder where the bottom is because I'm looking at quite a number of names in the real estate sector. And I will say on an evaluation standpoint, looking very attractive on a fundamental standpoint, looking very attractive. But what doesn't look attractive in real estate is the macro side and the technical side. Some of those charts, you know, really getting to like 52 week lows, not something you want to see. Now, why did the market sell off today? Look, the S&P 500 was actually down 0. 0.58% today. And it was two major reasons why we sold today. Number one was that ASML's earnings was actually a headwind for technology. Technology is the biggest sector. Semiconductor makes up 9% of the S&P. If we're going to get just downright terrible earnings here from a company like ASML, you're going to see selling. You're going to see selling in the big boys and that's going to lead the market lower. Secondly, this defensive rotation, okay, that kind of spooked everybody. That also led the selling. We're looking at utilities. I'm talking about stuff like staples, okay, something we really haven't seen. Staples have been red the last three out of the last four days. This last week except today so there's definitely a defensive rotation let's hop in the charts and i'll show you what what i mean all right so guys the s p 500 continues to be in this daily downtrend we continue to make lower lows here in the daily chart but have a look at the day down 0.58 percent the nasdaq 1.24 percent so rough rough day for the nasdaq 100 but then we look at the rsp down 0.21 percent so a lot of the selling here was actually contained in the rsp but this chart's still looking a little bit ugly I guess, but definitely some buying pressure forming at the bottom of these lows, but still overall lower lows when you look at it. When we had mid caps down 0.83%, higher beta took it on the chin. Growth completely underperformed value. Look at value right here, guys. This is kind of crazy when you think about it, right? Uh, down 0.08%, the value complex. Look at it in after hours, up 0.27%. Actually green for the day when you put it in perspective like that. A very, very interesting trade here, right? Look at what bonds did. They were up 0.46, a lot of buying in bonds, which means yields went lower. So there was a certain flight to quality, flight to defensives in terms of bonds. We saw that with 
utilities. We saw that with staples and also bonds. So there is definitely a safety trade happening today. And that is really concerning because if this persists, if this continues, this is literally the market telling you, hey, we do see some further bumpier signs along the road and we really want to get into assets that's going to protect our capital and that's essentially what the market is starting to tell us now this does need to materialize over the next couple of days even a week just one day of this is not going to be enough but it is the early signs of what could come and we saw stuff like Bitcoin down 3.9% on the day. Very similar to S&P 500 continues to just make uh, lower lows, higher lows, lower lows, lower highs on this daily downtrend. And we look at gold. Even though gold miners were up 1.57% today, gold remained largely flat. Same thing here with silver. The dollar did lose a smidge. However, you know, still on this massive daily uptrend. And then oil uh, was down 3% on the day, I believe. Yeah, 3.13%. And actually gap down and a f down a further 0.41 percent here so this 87 dollars 88 89 90 dollars continues to be a pretty big resistance level here for oil and i do think this is an interim top we can start to find support in the oil complex here at the 80 dollar uh, 80 range but i do think that we should see uh, oil circulate between 80 to 90 dollars over the next three to four months even towards the end of the year so i do think this is probably an interim top here for oil 90 dollars is a perfect range uh, for oil and it does get a bit problematic uh, above 90 into that 100 range so 80 to 90 that's exactly what uh, oilers want not necessarily politicians but let's actually have a look at the s p 500 very very interesting so guys we continue to be on this daily downtrend like i said before you know we're just making lows all the way down approaching you know very critical breadth metrics one month lows three month lows now a major line in the sand we've been looking at all week is this 5000 level it's actually you know 49.20 to the 5000 level is what we're really looking at but this is really the first leg of support that we want to look at to start buying for a potential bounce now we could start we started to see that in intraday trade we did get quite a number of wicks here at the bottom so there's definitely structural support that we could see here in the 5000 level but if we do push into this zone use as resistance continue lower we could actually sell all the way to as low as 49.20 and this is really where we need to find support below this line it gets pretty grim but i do think that we're going to find support in this level right here i've been pretty convicted on the fact that you know 5000 to 4920 is going to be the low for this pullback now i 100 percent can be wrong but at least this is what my models are telling me and that would represent a peak to trough drawdown of about 6.65 percent to the 5000 level we're looking at about just under uh, five percent about five percent so i do think that's a reasonable pullback given the strength of this market but let's actually hop on the five minute chart really really quickly so you can see this is where we opened right here we gapped up and then we made a succession of lower lows all the way to about the 5000 level where we found a lot of buy side support and yeah we bought the dip and we actually closed at these levels right here so very very rough day of trade for the bulls there was some light at the end of the tunnel towards the end of the day with the buying pressure we saw here all in all you have to look at this and you know we are still in a daily downtrend there's no way to spin this at all in the context of a weekly uptrend, but we are approaching these critical levels here in the weekly chart and bulls really need to start acting up, buying and you know looking to support the market at these levels right here. Because if they don't, it then becomes really, really ugly for the bull case and, and really, really good for the bear case. That being said, I'm still in favor of us bouncing at this 49.20 level. I think we probably are gonna have some price discovery below the 5,000 area, see what the market feels right here. We might go low, but I think this is where we find support for a bounce higher and then a move back to all time highs, but that's a bit far away. We do actually have to go ahead and, you know, break some of these uh, key levels, starting with uh, this high right here and then this high right here at the um, 5080 level, uh, 5150 level. And the market continues to be in fear. You can see just a week ago, we were in this neutral territory. We're now in fear and getting very closer to the extreme fear side. And this is exactly what I predicted when we were in the neutral zone. I said, we're going to move into the fear zone and we're probably going to move to this 25 level right here, this extreme zone. And just 
just a, a month ago we were here in this greed territory just goes to show how quickly this market can flip and how quickly technicals can really go from looking really good to looking really bad and why you have to approach this market in a very dynamic way in terms of asset allocation just so you don't get caught with your pants off so in today's earnings recap we are going to look at asml one of the key players in the semiconductor space now they dropped earnings and they beat on eps just you could pretty much say eps came in line the problem here was revenue for the quarter revenue missed by a pretty large margin this right here is nearly a six 100 million euro miss something like 12 percent miss on the revenue side also what we saw right here is that orders were down 60 percent quarter over quarter 5.9 billion dollars in last quarter's orders this quarter 700 million dollars now they did come out and say guidance is unchanged so revenue is going to be similar to financial year 2023 and financial year 2025 they're expecting significant growth so what this does tell me this miss right here and by the way one of their machines goes for 400 to 600 million dollars or euros what this essentially tells me is that one of their orders which was supposed to come in this quarter probably got delayed to the next quarter and that's why revenue for the financial year is unchanged as well as 2025 so this could be an outlier the problem here though is that asml has three customers it's intel samsung and tsm they make up 80 percent of asml's order volume those three companies make the majority of semiconductor chips in the entire world they're fabricators right asml's machines need to be replaced every seven years or after so many chips are made and they need to be repaired at a very specific time interval if orders are down and this isn't just a one quarter specific issue it could mean that the demand for AI chips is slowing significantly and that these companies won't need these machines in 2024 2025 and a lot of the demand we're seeing right now could just be something for this year that being said because guidance was largely unchanged shares were only down four percent in pre-market and if revenue guidance did change if they did say we're expecting materially lower guidance in financial year 2023 shares would have been down in the double digits especially considering the weight this company has in the semiconductor industry asml is a monopoly they make a very specific type of lithography machine extremely extremely high barriers to entry in terms of research development manufacturing as well as transportation and servicing of these lithography machines so rough core on revenues but I think that means we probably see a beat in the second quarter 2024 or maybe the third quarter this year we see a pretty substantial beat and we see orders up you know 60 70 percent on the quarter now guys looking at buybacks buybacks by corporation and clients off historic highs but still at very very high historic levels so the biggest buyer of stocks in this market continue to be corporates and this is one of the reasons why stock markets particularly in the US have been so resilient there is this buying pressure giving the market a bid however some of the major liquidity drivers are starting to dry up the Treasury general account and the reverse repo facility has been one of the major reasons why we've added liquidity into the market despite being in quantitative tightening over the past 18 months the TGA and RRP have actually overpowered QT by 417 billion dollars when there's ample liquidity it goes into stocks it goes into bonds it's very good for stocks very good for bonds however we are starting to see that dry up especially this tax season this tax season will force 300 billion dollars in liquidity drain and generally speaking when there's a lack of liquidity in the market when financial conditions tighten and people draw liquidity from other asset pools and the very first place they go is stocks and generally that could be one of the reasons why we started to see this underlying weakness that we have in stocks along with the fact that we are somewhat overvalued and we have pretty much gone from bottom left to top right in the last three to six months and this is going to be a massive massive headwind for stocks however there is still 371 billion dollars left here in the reverse repo facility so even though it has been drained from two and a half trillion dollars here at the start of 2023 there's still liquidity left in the market banks and major institutions who have money in here are drawing down from this facility but we can't deny the fact that there's still a significant amount in here and that will continue to support the market along with all of 
the other negative drivers that work against it. And all in all, all of these liquidity drivers provide a push and pull effect into the market. And if there's excess liquidity, we're going higher in stocks, in assets. If there's a liquidity shortfall, asset prices will suffer. Now let's actually talk about potential tailwinds for stocks. This right here is earnings and we're specifically going to talk about Magnificent 7 because we have some of the bigger players reporting earnings. And it's always good to look at these companies right here because they make up 20% plus of total earnings in the S&P 500. And I think excluding Tesla, it's much, much more. Now, Exhibit 20, Mag 7 earnings are expected to decelerate while the other 493 earnings are expected to improve. Now, that's not to say that Mag 7 earnings are at all bad. In fact, they're still gonna report 9% growth here, 10% growth here. It's just that as their growth is decelerating, the 493 is actually accelerating to the upside right here, which is actually what you want to see. And according to Bofa, tech's outperformance has been highly correlated to its earnings versus the S&P 500 since the tech bubble. Narrowing growth differentials should lead the market to broaden out. Now, we also got a great note here from Savita from Bofa. She says, one of the reasons why the Magnificent 7 saw an earnings recovery before the other 493, because they were in an earnings recession first in the second half of 2002, which led tech companies to cut costs sooner than others, which led to an earlier recovery in earnings. So they they were just the front runners. They were really just the leaders in the pack and that's why they're leading earnings right now. But that is also why S&P 493 is expected to accelerate their earnings in the later half of 2024. And you can actually see this recovery very, very clearly right here. You can see that as the earnings had decelerated here in the MAG7, the 493 EBIT margin hadn't accelerated as much. But when the MAG7 accelerated to the upside, the 493 didn't quite recover as much. And hopefully what we really want to see for the 493 is something along the lines of this, you know, movement upwards while the Magnificent 7 trails and they sort of meet in the middle somewhere. That would be a very, very healthy market. But if the MAG7 continues to outperform on a margin basis like it is right now, you'll continue to see these companies over-owned and overweight in the portfolios of investors. Now, let's actually look at relative sector valuations. Now, I know this is for the S&P 500 as a whole, still very relative when you think about it. And just looking at price to book ratio, price to operating cash flow, forward PE, and then looking at the implied upside to get to the historical average. And generally speaking, this often does correlate to expected future returns, not necessarily 12 months, but longer term returns. But let's look at Infotech as a whole. Look at the price to book ratio, the current 2.52 versus the average of 1.5. Implied upside is negative 40% versus energy, which is 67%. So you could say that on a price to book basis, Infotech is heavily overvalued. At the same time, we also see on a price to operating cash flow basis, quite overvalued relative to history. And the same is true here for forward PE relative to the average. Expected upside here for Infotech is negative 18%. So if you are looking to find growth in this market, tech is looking very, very expensive. But what is looking very, very cheap right now is actually real estate. And this is one of the reasons why on my Twitter, I was looking into the Triple H Howard Hughes Corporation. And that's because if you actually look at the actual fundamentals of real estate, they're actually trading, you know, quite heavily under book value. Look at the implied upside here, 45%. Look at the relative forward PE to its historical average, implied upside 85%. And if you look hard enough with the right due diligence, you can get fantastic assets for absolute pennies on the dollar. The thing is, you just have to be willing to sit through the volatility that might ensue for the rest of 2024, 2025. But if you actually look at it in aggregate, really on a forward PE relative basis, industrials, technology, and consumer discretionary are the only really overvalued sectors. Everything else is deeply undervalued. Look at energy, 16% here for staples. Look at healthcare, 17%. And then we have stuff like materials, which is fairly valued, financials, which is fairly valued on a forward PE basis. But I think that's because their earnings are decreasing next year. And then comm services, very, very cheap, 31% implied upside relative to its historical average. And the same is true here for utilities at 20%. So guys, there's definitely still great value to be had in this market on a PE basis, on an operating cash flow basis, as well as a price to book basis. Technology isn't the only play in town. There's plenty of ways to play the S&P 500. Now let's actually talk about the macro environment. This right here is the Fed GDP. Now we are accelerating here in growth 
3% for the first quarter 2024. Kind of crazy when you think about that. And that has to do with a lot of the data we're getting. We got hotter than expected retail sales. I know housing starts were a bit rough. In fact, not a bit rough. They were a dumpster fire. All the other data points that we are seeing in the market right now is coming in hotter than expected. And that does go to show the resilience of this economy despite higher rates. However, it's not all sunshine and roses. We got a note here from Goldman. Lower hiring is the flip side of fewer quits. On average, recent indicators suggest the labor market remains strong. But one outlier to the downside is the hiring rate, which has fallen from a peak of 4.5% to 3.7% and is now noticeably lower below its pre-pandemic rate of 3.9%. Looking across both industries and states, we find that declines in gross hiring have been connected to declines in worker quits, but not to increase in layoffs or slower payroll growth, suggesting that employers have cut back on gross hiring, mostly because they have needed to replace fewer departing workers. And that is pretty self-explanatory. I don't have to explain it, but Goldman is seeing you know, some weaker fundamentals in hiring but that's offset by workers quitting their jobs less. So I guess they're happy where they are. They're happy with the pay. Wages are accelerating. Disposable income is quite high, but it also does reflect less optimism among workers about the ease of finding a new job, essentially the labor market becoming a little bit looser. So things in the economy are starting to not look quite as good as they did a month ago, particularly with some of the hotter data we're getting, as well as the job market loosening ever so slightly, at least according to this Goldman data and this note they gave us right here. And so for the rest of this month, we do have to keep a keen eye on the employment data, the JOLTS data. If we start to see tangible deterioration in the jobs market, that could materialize materially affect the consumer, the economy, and by extension, earnings. So there's a lot of moving parts to consider with the jobs market, the economy, but all in all, things are still looking good, although we are starting to see the early signs of a turnaround. Okay, guys, we're going to be looking at some key charts. Now, this is the election cycle right here, the average election year versus what we're doing right now. And guys, you can see we're breaking down in a very serious way in what is normally quite an upbeat period here during an election year. However, from about April to June, we do generally tend to travel sideways here in this chart. What does that mean for us? We could probably just trend sideways, um, you know, up until probably this May, June area right here. That would be 100% normal. Now, we don't actually want to look at the actual level. We want to look at the trend because that tells us what is going to happen and even though we have not followed trend it doesn't mean we can't start following it now and we do have to look at history look at stuff like this and say hey this is what is probable to happen and i think that's sideways action or further downside at least according to this cycle model the core market model still says that we are in this overbought territory right here particularly because we are above the zero line however we are starting to break down in a major way we hit this overbought territory came down and we're traveling towards this zero area right here and the second we go below it that's when it becomes sort of risk off and then we will probably see extended sell side in the market but as it is right now according to this model this is nothing more than just a routine pullback that we should look to buy the dip on until this probably crosses the zero line that's when we can maybe look at becoming a little bit more risk off than what we are right now looking at the risk on risk off indicator very similar situation it still is technically risk on this pullback should be looked as only that not a correction, not anything more sinister than what it is until we probably get into, you know, this actual risk off environment where we can then see pretty extended sell side. However, as it is right now, sometimes we normally get to this line and it does offer a lot of support for the market. So if we do pull back to there, that might be good. That's often where we can get support. But if we do break down below it, that's when things get a little crazy. And that's when we get volatility. Looking at yield spreads, and this is why I'm still not super worried about this being anything more than just a routine pullback and a routine pullback can be you know upward of 10 percent this right here is 2020 we're sitting between zero and one percent in the triple a corporate bonds if we look at the b double a corporate bonds again not just historically low levels some of the lowest levels ever seen and i've looked at this chart going back since the year 2000 this is some extremely extremely low yield spreads we have here in BAA corporate bonds and until we see an uptick in both charts in a very meaningful way like we saw here in 2022 you just really want to buy the dip in this market you know the big boys the big players are seeing no more credit risk than they saw a couple of weeks ago now data for the rest of the week guys the only major data points we have left is like initial jobless claims and then existing home sales and a couple of leading indicators. And that's really, it's a very light week of data, but a very pivotal week of earnings, especially for some of the names we spoke about today. And we do have TSM tomorrow. Guys, but if you've made it up until here, thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please subscribe, hit that notification bell, like this video and leave a comment for the algorithm. Cheers.